Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I have got several things that I want to share with you. We've got some cutter grinder work that I need to do. Haven't shown that machine being used in quite some time on the channel. Got some stones that I've broken that I want to reshape or square up. I've also got a couple pieces of lathe tooling that I want to make that have broken recently and just out of. So we'll share with you all of that. I've got some shop errands that are that I need to run and I want to take you guys uh, with uh, as well and some other things. So thank you for watching and let's get started. So right now I am 100% down as far as welding. Can't do anything until I get my gas cylinders filled. So that's the shop errand that I need to run. I need to take both my MIG cylinder, which is a 75-25 mix, and my TIG cylinder, which is 100% argon. We need to take these downtown, get them exchanged for a couple full cylinders. We're gonna be taking the shop truck, which is the crew cab dually, and you know, show you that process, take you a ride in that truck. So as of now, we got about 300 miles on this recently LS swapped 1986 C30 crew cab that we pulled out of a field about five or six months ago if you're not up on it. So we pulled it out of the field, we put a 60 LS, 4 l transmission, a set of wheels and tires, and did some interior work. Basically, a little bit of rust repair, cleaned it up, just to kind of get it back on the road and maybe modernize it a little bit. And every time I drive this thing, I just smile the entire time. It drives so much different than what you'd think that old one-ton heavy work truck would. That long wheelbase, man, it just runs out like a Cadillac going down the road. It has been such a nice truck up to this point. I could not be happier with the way that this thing has turned out. Pricey, but you know, if you're gonna do any welding, you know, it's just, just 
must have. And that's what happens when you run over a freshly painted yellow line on the road. Look at that, Cora. Glad I drove this truck. So argon's symbol, periodic table, is AR. It's in group 18. It's a noble gas. It's actually the third most abundant gas in the Earth's atmosphere. But yet, they still charge you an arm and leg for a tank of it. So my wallet cries a little bit every time I go buy welding gas. And I try to buy as little of it as possible, but it is a necessity. And, you know, that's just the way it goes. But I'll tell you what I do to use as little of it as possible and still get good results. Now, used to, I would set my welder up to where I had, I knew, way more than I needed, and I would just weld on. And I, I would go through a lot of gas that way. But what I've been doing for the last few years is setting up my gas flow for the particular job that I'm doing because I do lots of different jobs and that changes. If let's say I'm welding a lot of the stainless stainless tubing, what I'll do is I'll take a test piece, set it up, run some welds, keep decreasing my gas flow until I start seeing negative results and then I'll bump the gas flow up a little bit from there and I know that for that job that I'm doing, I'm using just a little more than what is required in order to to get the job done and no more. I'm not just pumping gas out into the environment for no reason because I've done a lot of that. And uh, it costs money. It's going to be different for everybody, so I'm not going to give you a number. You're not going to be using the same cup that I use. You're not welding in the same shop. It may be windy where you're welding. I don't know. It could be. And if it is, then you're going to obviously need a little more gas flow than what you would in a non-windy environment. So experiment with your welder and your setup on the material that you're welding and see what you can get away with. You may find that you can cut your gas use in half. I mean, if you just go by what the books say, you know, then uh, you know, you're probably using too much. That's, that's what I'll say. Same thing with a uh, MIG welder. Like if you're set up for running big fat beads, you've got big molten puddles that take a long time to solidify, yeah, you're gonna need quite a bit of gas flow there. And versus if you're doing spot welds with a MIG welder, you know, those spot welds, like I'm doing body work, well, they may solidify in half a second. And if you've got your welder still set up for four or five seconds of post flow, gas flow after you let off the trigger to let the puddle cool, if your welder's set up for that, well then three and a half out of those four seconds it's just completely wasted. So take some time, set your gas flow up for the actual job that you're doing and you'll to the minimum amount and you can find out what that is by reducing the gas flow. And you may find that your gas cylinders last twice as, twice as long, maybe even more, if you're mindful and you set it up for each job. So that's what I do and it, and it really seems to work for me. It's made a big difference on my gas usage. So take that advice or not. It's just what I do around here, and it works. So my first project over here on the cutter grinder is, is a simple one. It's going to be quick, and then we'll move on. I need to square up the edges on this slip stone. It's just a wedge-shaped, thin wedge-shaped stone. Every one of my slip stones I've either worn off, like this one, worn to a, uh, to a radius, or I've dropped them and chipped the edges off, and I want to have at least one stone that has nice sharp edges on them so I can get down and into corners and stuff. That's kind of the idea. So let me show you the diamond wheel and stuff that we're using. We'll blast this uh, uh, project real quick and then we will move on to uh, something else. So there's the stone that we're going to be cutting. I'm going to cut it on both sides and I'm going to cut at less than 90. I want to be able to use this really thin edge down here to get up into like a slot to get all the way up in the corners. That's what I've needed uh, here recently in the past and not having a stone with a good, a thin stone with a good sharp edge on it has caused me a little grief. A little piece of rubber to put underneath my clamp here in an attempt not to break the stone. And I'm just gonna set this up by eye, uh, maybe four or five degrees, I'm guessing. Something like, something like that. So that should be good, hopefully. 
Snug this down just enough. I'm gonna take it easy. I'm not gonna try to cut it all through in one pass, just kind of because I'm not holding it that great. You can see this this really super thin diamond wheel. It's chipped. Won't hurt a thing. I see people you know, talk about throwing them away because they're chipped. For stuff like this, not hurt a thing. It may, in fact, that may even make it cut freer. I'm not for sure, but I haven't had any problem with that being chipped uh, with the work that I've done in the past with it. So let's uh, let's get this thing turned on and. Bzz, 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 bzz. Cut this thing in two. For sure that I didn't feed in enough. We'll see. It cleans up good. If it doesn't, I'll have to do this again. Side one, cut. Yeah, looks good. than uh, a little less than 90 so you can get up up in a little corner so there we go that is done now let me before we before we make the cutters that I need to make for the lathe I want to show you a quick little uh, fixture that I haven't shown on the channel before that would actually make an awesome little shop project for anybody who who's interested so on the table of the grinder here I have a very very interesting little uh, tool bit grinding fixture. People have been making these since the beginning of machine tools, and I can't tell if this is a shop made or a commercial piece. It kind of has mixings of both. Maybe it's just super old. Uh, not Well, it is old, but not for sure. Uh, and I'll show you. We'll break this thing down. I'll show you its construction. It's really very simple and could be made by anybody. Even you could make this a, uh, a Variation of this with nothing but a lathe and a four jaw, I, th I think, I think, and a drill press. So let me uh, get you in closer. We'll show you the features of this thing, and then I'll use it to grind this tool bit super quick, and then we'll move on. So let's break this thing down real quick. This holds five sixteenths tool bits, which is one that I rarely use except for on my mini lathe. It's got a little thumb screw to hold the tool bit uh, into the fixture. It's got built-in relief. So if I was building this, I would make this a square block and I would use my grinding vise to set the relief angle that I personally wanted and not build it into the fixture. That's just me. But let me show you the construction of this. It is indexed. You can see this, this rotates. It's got index marks around it, or degrees, 60, 30, 14 and a half, and then zero. Um, and it is indexed simply by a pen. So that's it. So if you want to do 60 degree tool bit, grind one side, 60, go to the other side, grind that, and that's what we're gonna do. But let me show you how this thing's constructed real quick. So we just got a thumb screw in the back to lock this thing down, or just to hold it, I guess, tension on it, keep it all tight together. And it's nothing more than a piece of round stock that's had a slot cut in it. Now, 
if I was building one of these, I would try to find a way to where I could make it hold, maybe do a stepped hole, a stepped slot, one for half inch, one for three eighths, and then one for five sixteenths maybe, or quarter, whatever. That would kind of be uh, what I would think, and maybe a little larger screw you know, to, to hold that. That way you could grind a variety of bits with this. So you can see the index holes in the back. Maybe a, uh, you know, a little index plate to get those in. There's the socket that it, uh, that it rides in. So the, really nothing to this thing other than a base, a pin, some index holes, and a way to hold the tool bit. That is pretty much it. So really simple construction would be a great shop project for anybody who is interested. Get the idea? Let's get this thing set up and grind this piece of circle. This was the brand name. I believe that's the brand name of this. Yeah, circle, high speed steel. So before we use this thing, I quickly want to show you why I think that this is probably a shop made item and not necessarily commercial made, but I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. You can see it's just not that great of a shape. It may have been just a rough casting and, you know, as old as this thing is, potentially it could have been hand ground to, to shape just from the factory. Another thing that makes me believe that this is shop made, or at least points toward the direction of shop made, is that there's a hole in the base here and clearly that's for bolting this thing down, but they left that at an angle that top of this, at least at the bolt hole, should be recessed and parallel with the bottom or else when you tighten your bolt down it's going to torque it at an angle. You know, it's going to hit on this side and, and not the back side. But this could also be held in a vise. It could be clamped down. It could be held to a mag chuck. Obviously there's lots of ways to hold it down and that was probably just an option. So, I don't know. Uh, the numbers look relatively good that are stamped on there, the degrees. And, uh, you know, it's just got things that point in both directions, I guess. Kind of hard to tell. So if you've got one of these, let me know. And that will clearly mean that it is, uh, is not shop made and is a commercial item. Let's check this out. So, you know, if you're making a threading tool, you could obviously, if you were making this for yourself, you could make it grind any angle you wanted. Goodness, that's sticky. It looks pretty good. Could have been a little better centered, but you know, we're just messing around here. Yo, very, very nice little tool bit. You could get very repeatable results with one of these. That's the idea, really. Simplify things and make it repeatable. 
So back before insert tooling, you know, this was your insert. You'd have a guy on a cutter grinder and he'd be grinding up a bunch of these. So you didn't have to stop. The guy running the lathe didn't have to stop and sharpen bits. You had a guy that did that. And uh, this was a way for that guy on the grinder to get all of the cutters the same. That way if a guy dulled one in the middle of a job, he could just swap over to a new one and it would be ground the same, not hand ground. Does a good job. So here's the piece of tooling that we're gonna be turning into an actual lathe tool. And uh, we'll lay it out with some blue. I'll show you exactly, explain to you what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And uh, you know, after we lay it out, we'll get started. But I wanted to quickly, I, I don't know if I showed this or not, but check that out. I usually keep it on my workbench. A piece of inch and a quarter by nine inch Super Momax Cobalt, made in Cleveland, USA. That is personally the largest chunk of unground high-speed steel you know, tool bit wise that I've ever seen. Um, I think it's 32 mil, if I'm not mistaken, 32 mil by 230 or something like that for the metric guys. It's a heck of a chunk of high speed steel. Uh, big industrial tooling is what that is. Use that on a big old planer or something back in the day. But anyway, this is what we're gonna be using and that's just a piece of 5 8 or 16 mil cobalt. So now that our layout fluid's dry, I can start constructing this tool. And what I'm going to be making is just one of the most basic shop tools that, I mean, you use in a shop, and that is a parting blade out of square stock. Now, I do not own a dedicated parting blade holder for this tool post. I have not made one yet, and I don't know where you would find one for the tool posts that I have. So I am stuck making my parting blades out of square stock. They just, they work well for me, and I have a cutter grinder, and, you know, that's the reason double-ended because I can snap off one end and then just say a few words under my breath and then flip it over and have an identical one on the other end. Also, I have, it saves me setup time on the cutter grinder. I can make two, not as fast as I can make one, but it saves me all of the tool flopping and carrying on that I would normally have to do. I can just flip the tool over and, you know, do everything twice. It just save me a little time twist and bolts and stuff on my cutter grinder. So that's what we're gonna do. Let's get it laid out and start grinding away some steel because we got a lot to grind away. Now I'm gonna make the cutting blade half an inch, slightly over half inch, maybe about five eighths of an inch long. So I can part off material that is up to an inch in diameter. So that is what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna make sure that I grind my blades my parting blades on the chuck side of the of the tool that way um, that way I can part up right up next to the chuck and I'm also taking advantage of the end reliefs that are already pre-cut into these tool blanks you can see that all of them even even this big chunk here you can see it has reliefs cut into it so so taking advantage of the angle that's in the, in the end of these from the factory just keeps us from having to remove that stock when we relieve the front. So that's, that's the reason. So all of that material has to be gone on both sides. So even though I got a cutter grinder, I often blast away bulk material on the bench grinder. I'd find it, you know, about just as quick to remove chunks of material with the bench grinder as it is to try to set up in the cutter grinder with a like a slitting blade or an abrasive blade I just never have had a whole lot of luck doing it that way so I usually keep it simple stick to the bench grinder for bulk material removal I don't know if I mentioned but my blade is going to be a hundred and fifty thousandths of an inch wider I think that's close to four mil and the reason for that is it's a compromise it gives my blade enough thickness to where it wicks heat away. It also, um, you know, makes it stout enough to where it doesn't break that easy. So, you know, not super thick to where it wastes a lot of stock. Just kind of a medium, at least in my opinion.
So bolted to the table of the cutter grinder is my multi-angled grinding vise, which I always get comments on this. Every time I've ever shown it, I think somebody's like, man, where does a guy get one of those at? Because they're super handy. They really are. Um, I just did a quick Google search. You can find them on eBay, sold through Shars, which is a great company, by the way. Shars is. They support the Barzy Summer Bash and, and other things. Very, very nice. 170, 180 bucks, if I remember correctly. So you can do compound angles with it. You can use it on a cutter grinder, obviously, or you could take the keys off of the feet of this thing. It's keyed for the table. You could take those off because they're just bolted on. You could stick it on the mag chuck of your surface grinder or whatever and do exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna grind two angles at one time right now. Let's see. I'm going to just finish the, well, what am I doing? Finish the front of this thing. Because it is not a finished angle. 20 degree, that's fine. That's a little excessive, but 20 degrees is fine. We'll grind that. And I'm also going to grind a left-handed angle on the front of this a few degrees. So when I use this thing parting, it will leave the burr on the chuck side, and then the other side, it'll be exactly the same setup. So get this guy in here. We need 20 degrees. So 5, 10, 15, no, 10, 20. The graduations on this particular um, multi-angled vise, they look like they were laser etched in and they're pretty faint. So the quality of this thing is okay, but you know, it's good enough for, for what it is, I guess. So we need to do angle. Let's go three degrees. There we go. Now we will grind two angles and one shot. I'm going to move my vise down just a little bit. So a little closer look. So we've got this angle here, which we dialed in with this axis, so 20 degree. And then we want to put a slight angle on that, 3 degrees. So we've got in this axis here, 3 degrees. Locked it down. So now we're set up to grind both those angles at, at the same time. Oh, cutter grinder, you are my friend and I love using you. Must tighten your wheel. That was smart. There we go. Front is ground. Now I need to put relief from the top down. It needs to be that this cutting blade needs to be the widest right here at the tip. It needs to narrow as it goes down. Not much. I'm going to put a few degrees on each side. Probably a couple degrees would be fine. In each side just so it's widest at the top or wider at the top than it is at the bottom. Now it also needs to be wider at the front leading edge than it is at the very back. So when this thing enters the work, the only thing that's touching is the front uh, cutting edge. So we've got, we've got it set up here to where we can compound both back relief and side relief in at the same time. I will have to flip it and add the relief to the other side, but you get the idea. It's all the same thing, basically. 
So almost done. Two more quick setups to finish this tool out. I have to put relief on this side because right now this side's just parallel. Got to put three degrees on this side, which is already dialed in to the fixture. Also have to put uh, uh, three degrees back, just like I did on this side. So we need to put in that relief, and then I'm going to put probably I don't know three or four degrees in the top, give it a little rake, and that is it. So. Fixture's already set up for relief front to back. I just need to change it because I had to flip this tool over. I need to change the fixture, which is basically reverse what I've got in there. So let's go three degrees in the other direction. There. I'll grind back to the end of the cutting edge. And, you know, that finish that side, then just flip the tool and do the same thing, and boom, Bob's your uncle. So this outside, the cutting edge, will clean up last, showing it, by the way the fixture is set up, to be the thickest portion. That's what we're at. So let's get a good look at this. So the width of the end, it does not matter on a parting blade used on a manual machine, but you know, it doesn't hurt to shoot for numbers, just for your own practice. So within three tenths on that one of 150 thousandths, and basically right on the money, well, yeah, let's just say we're on 150 with that. But the second you dress these because of their relief that's ground in them, the second that you sharpen it, you lose that. So, I mean, it's not, this is not a slotting blade. It's a parting blade. So its dimensions are, they're just not important unless you're doing CNC work. So there we go. Looks pretty dang good. Let's take this over to the lathe. We can get right up next to the chuck. That was the goal with this, both sides. Let's take it over and do just a quick little, quick little test, test shoot on it and that's it. Done, boom. So I am all set up in the lathe here to do a test run. Now I know that you know what's gonna happen here. 
but I can't make a lathe tool without showing it in practice. What I can do is tell you what I try to implement to make a parting job successful because it's hard. I still break tools. Parting is just one of those things that it, it can be tough. Make sure that your tool is on center or right below center. That's what I do. Make sure that the tool is going in as straight as you can possibly do it, especially if you're making a deep part or parting off a big chunk. Because if it's not going in straight, the blade will go in a bit, it'll, everything will be just perfectly fine until it runs at a relief angle on the sides because it's not straight, it starts rubbing, and then, boom, you know, if you're saying words you probably shouldn't. So, tool on center, tool parallel, run coolant, make sure that your gibs and stuff are as tight as they can be and still operate freely, and use the proper size parting tool you know, for the size of your lathe. If you're running a mini lathe, a quarter inch wide parting blade is just not going to do it. So thinner the blade, you know, the less pressure on the machine, probably the better off you're going to be. So let's see if we can't part off a chunk here and leave the flashing or the burr on the part that's in the chuck instead of on the piece that we part off, saving us the job of removing that flash once it's off, because that can be a pain in the tail. So this is um, 6061, you know, just proof of concept here. Boom, part fell down in the lathe chip pan and our flashing is left on the stock. And we can just continue on in and you know it'll clean that up. So there you go, that worked. So there's a quick look at the actual piece. Really nice finish, it's going in straight. You know, it's not rubbing, no burr to speak of anyway. Ready to rock. So I am going to call that a wrap. The tool and cutter grinder is one of my most favorite machines. Although it's one of the most complicated machines to run, at least in my opinion, that and the axial and radial relief grinder, that's a pretty complicated uh, machine to run as well. But what the tool and cutter grinder offers the home shop machine guy, it's freedom. Freedom from having to go out and search for custom size tooling when you can just you know, if you have the ability, that is, grind it yourself. And I am by far uh, not, I am by far am not an expert on that machine. I've got tons of holes in my knowledge uh, in regards to that machine, but what little I do know has given, given me the ability to, you know, take chances with tooling, try different things. I've learned a ton about tool and cutter geometry, which is valuable to the home shop guy. So, it is. It's one of my most favorite machines and not one that you hear a ton about. In fact, in my everyday travels, just talking to folks, I don't know if I've ever ran into anybody just in the wild who says, yeah, I love the cutter grinder. I run one all the time. You know, those days are gone. Insert tooling's in, but, you know, insert tooling costs money, but running a cutter grinder costs time. So, yeah, six or half dozen, whatever. I enjoy running it. I will say that. So that is it. Thank you for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who's helped me out whatsoever, it is much appreciated. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.